As is our custom, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today, the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and acknowledge their emergent leaders, many of whom I have the opportunity to work with and be influenced by. And it's an extraordinary thing seeing young people really step up to the leadership plate. I also acknowledge um, other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here, um, our fellow Australians, it's a great thing that you're all here this afternoon at this conference really thinking long and hard about how we can use our skills and expertise to really um, build our nations together and take the opportunity to extend hands of friendship wherever we get the chance to. And for visitors, and for the wonderful introduction from Catherine, thank you. I also acknowledge all of you and your ancestors as well and thank them for the lives that they've lived to bring us all here together into this room on this glorious Sunday winter in Melbourne. I'm going to talk with you a little bit today about protecting Australians' children, um, particularly the first thousand days. I've had the opportunity to think this through for a little while. Um, I first came to understand about the first thousand days as a nutritional intervention used from international um, countries thinking about the Millennium Development Goals and particularly in sustainability initiatives within developing countries. And what it's been able to do here in the Australian context is have a little bit of a different kind of flavour and we're going to be able to talk with you about that today. And the way that we've been able to implement it here in an Australian context necessarily does involve community leaders. It does necessarily involve practitioners from a range of different backgrounds and it's inspiring leaders in policy and systems innovators and particularly around thought leaders from a range of different communities. And what it has also done is facilitate for us some courageous conversations. We're going to explain to you a little bit more about what they look like and certainly about what it means to stand up nowadays and be a champion. It's just not easy. I wish it was, but what it is is that we need people to be able to work in and live within and work with us in Indigenous conceived of and led initiatives. What it has become is, is an unstoppable force, we believe. I'm just about to meet tomorrow with the 20 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders, um, community practitioners, and leaders by another name, and what we're really doing is thinking about this as a process to be able to build our own nations. The Genesis Point has happened within a university, and that has its own um, issues, but it's really interesting to know that we are the architects of the, lead, of the road ahead for our own communities. So we are um, professors and lawyers and doctors and nurses, and we are um, environmental scientists and um, people who've been able to work in, in artistic endeavours and have creative ways of being able to imagine ourselves in the world. And all of those people have been brought together into this space. It is a way of being able to facilitate decision led lead, um, leadership and we believe it really does facilitate self-determination in that what we are doing is aiming to achieve full citizenship rights at an unprecedented time. Our majority of our population in Indigenous Australia is under the age of 21 and over half of our population again are of the age of 15 and it mirrors a population bubble unlike any that we've ever had on the planet before. The majority of young people coming through, particularly those under the age of 19, are adolescents in unprecedented times. The planetary pressures that we're all experiencing, planetary pushback, there has never been this number of adolescents alive at any other time in the history of humanity. And I find that just an extraordinary thing to think about. We're also suffering from a range of endemic and chronic system failures in regard to how we deal with the issues of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country. And we believe that we do need innovation and it is new approaches that we're trying to think about. And we also need to return to a set of values and morals that underpin our progress in this country since time out of mind. The other thing is that we also know that service delivery agencies and the service delivery sector have great ideas about models from Harvard or other countries that are being brought into this Australian context and adopted and changed. But actually, the only thing that is going to work 
for our families that are experiencing a range of vulnerabilities is to engage with and learn from successful families in our own communities. So it really is this family to family um, conversation that we need to be able to have. The other issue that comes up for us time and again is this idea of protecting. And protection has underpinned a range of policy initiatives in this country that have seen the removal of children from their families. And we've now got over 13,000 average one Torres Strait Islander children that live outside of the context of families. It's the largest number of children in out-of-home care, again, in the history of this country. And it's going to be a really interesting conversation between Australian um, policy makers and leaders with the UN Convention on the Rights of Children in 2018, when we have to answer why um, Australia's Indigenous population is most overrepresented in child protection, in out-of-home care, in incarceration and other kinds of service systems that are really geared towards um, deficit language and deficit experiences of people. We've also got um, a series of um, lead organisations that don't value or appreciate the protective factors that are inherent in culture. And in terms of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture, the kinship arrangements and other family networks that have been completely disrupted over the last 200 plus years have got an extreme, um, an extremely powerful um, cultural cognizance about them, which is protection. And we don't get culture funded, not in any of our organisations and not in any of our families. And in terms of the ways in which we conceive of and think about the first thousand days, we've really had to think about the role and position of men. Most often than not, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men are described as perpetrators of violence. They are the sexual assault um, perpetrators against children. And we very rarely hear about men and their capacity for nurturance and their beautiful selves that they bring to the nurturance of children. And across all of our communities, there are good men that we never hear anything about. And in terms of what, we've, what we have heard about, though, is the need for non-Indigenous men to come in and protect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and children from the violence perpetrated by our men. And I am very keen and aware now that the whole family violence discourse is framed around a gender, um, a gender response where we have to protect all women and children from all men. I don't agree with it. And I actually think that what we need to do is have a really courageous conversation about the nature of violence and what that looks like in our communities. And in terms, in t in the other thing that we need to protect our children from, I think, is the forensic nature with which we are doing the training of professionals that are geared towards saving children. And we've got a very forensic approach to that, not a compassionate approach. I think that that also needs to be challenged the other things that you need to understand about me is that I have a really specific way of thinking about how we engage with the world. We're not born into a society, we're born into an ecosystem. And that has very clearly come from um, my lineage. My grandmother's country is from Murray Island up in the Torres Strait. Her father was um, born up in Murray Island. And we have a very specific saying there, which is about children being carried in the wombs of their mothers and then held grown up in the wombs of their fathers, which is in the context of country. So men have a responsibility about looking after country, as do women, but in terms of where I come from, there is this extension about um, the capacity for nurturing. So women hold children during a particular part of their time and country holds all of us throughout the rest of our lives. The other thing is it's very hard to be an average or Torres Strait Islander person hearing about the way that we're described in every single conference or reading any research paper about what it is that we look like. And I can guarantee to you the highly formulised, peer-reviewed research paper starts off with a sentence which says, Average and Torres Strait Islander people are the most disadvantaged people in anyone here in this country and we have a life expectancy which is 18 years less than any other single Australian. And that then sets up the frame of how we're discussed and we're talked about. All the statistics don't refer to our many successes or our resilience or our extraordinary preciousness as the oldest living continuing culture anywhere else in the world. Uh, what we talked about is only described in our deficit. 
And so what we need to do is kind of reformulate that and think about families as the place in which health equity is going to be achieved, not by services, sorry to say. It will be the adolescents of today who will be the equity implementers in 2030, and what we need to do is start engaging those young people in conversations about what it means to achieve and attain equity and what is your role in making that happen. And in terms of what that is, um, we're very clear and fortunate in this first thousand days work to be able to promote that. So I'm going to talk through um, this presentation. I'm sorry if I sound a little bit like an auctioneer. I'm just very conscious of time. And as you can well appreciate, this is 30 years, the culmination of my life experience. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the catalyzing environment for this, some of the design principles, the model itself, what works in regions, and the role of the university. I think is one of the major institutions that have got a role to play in what humanity looks like and experiences over the next generation. Um, universities have a, a responsibility to grow and evolve and change, and that's difficult for some of us to do. Um, in terms of the way that we conceive of this, we take a holistic view, and that's problem number one, because no one funds anything in a holistic way, and very rarely do we have, are we able to have wide enough um, discourses or disciplines that can engage with the holism that's inherent in the way that we consider health. But it is much more than just an individual notion of health. It is very collectivist and we take into account a person's social, emotional, cultural well-being and we think about a person's contribution to the health and well-being of the entire community. And the most recent National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan talks about health being achieved in a racist free system. Just out of interest, who here works in a racist free system? Mm, interesting, one person. I think that's an extraordinary indictment in that we are all participating in either the perpetuation of racism, even though we ourselves personally may not aspire to being racist. So just to keep that in the back of our minds. The impetus was long and um, exciting, and I think it gives you a bit of a um, an idea about how I think about things. But I was the chair for the National Average on Torres Strait Islander Dementia Action Group with the unfortunate acronym Nancy Dag. And, <laughs> and we started to talk about why on earth are we having, in our communities again, a lot of um, people in their early, uh, late 40s, early 50s ending up with dementia. And like most people who are influenced by ignorance, I preliminary thought it was because of the rates at which um, people in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in rural and remote areas were drinking. So, ah, oh, it's all alcohol related. Okay, I've got this. And in fact, what we ended up doing was a whole range of cognitive impairment assessment um, investigations across Kimberley and then again in Sydney and then in the mid north coast of New South Wales. And actually, it wasn't alcohol related at all, it was vascular related to inches. So, around the ability for people to, um, to, to have good health and well being beyond that midlife range of crisis issues that we deal with, obesity, um, around chronic diseases, and those kinds of things. Anyway, if you want a good vascular system, it all happens in pregnancy. And I thought, what? I can't believe this. I've got to start thinking about the health and well being of 80 year olds in utero. I just couldn't believe that that was the case. <laughs> But how long is this? But pregnancy is the new public health intervention for healthy ageing. So any time you're pregnant, you're just considering the fact that you're actually not birthing a baby, you're birthing a potential 80-year-old. So just put that out there. The other thing is that there are some real perversities built into policy drivers and decisions. And these ones that are made by at-risk populations are pretty significant. One of the most profound teachers I ever had in my life was 15. Um, standing in front of me, pregnant, smoking. Of course, moral, moral high ground here. Yeah, smoking. I said, at least I'm not doing heroin anymore. I went, okay. <laughs> so that was a fantastic way of doing harm minimization for her. But what it was was quite an extraordinary thing. I did a lot of work in sexual reproductive health, worked a lot with that license. And she told me that she was 15 and about to, um, her, her mother would no longer be eligible for family allowance supplement because she was about to turn 16. But if she could have this baby, give that baby to her mum to grow up, then her mum would continue to be eligible for those payments. Um, she had a boyfriend whose car had blown in the front yard, was sitting there unused, too young to get a credit card, had bad credit rating anyway from Telstra bill, 
but she did have a baby, get baby allowance money, which would actually go towards fixing the car and getting it registered and back on the road. She herself um, was just finished year 10, was living in a rural community in northern New South Wales, which was severely drought affected at the time, no point in market economy, didn't see the point of going on to school. If she had a baby at that time, she would be doing what all of her other peers were doing, and she'd be eligible for supporting parents' benefit, not New South Wales. She could get a two-bedroom flat, not a bed sit, and a whole range of other things that had actually impacted upon her decision about becoming pregnant. All of them policy-led initiatives that were about welfare. And but when you're actually living in these places that are geographically isolated, where you've got a whole range of decisions that you're trying to make, she made some fairly extraordinary decisions. I was also chair of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Equality Council. See the rise of FASD starting to emerge in our communities. Understood then the power of the Abyssinarian Project. I went, of course, the Abyssinarian Project, Dr. Google under the table. What the hell does Abyssinarian mean? But what it is, it's basically an early way of engaging in literacy from children being four months old. I said, oh, now we've got to start teaching our kids to read at four months old. But what it does, particularly for those who've got developmental vulnerabilities, is lift their IQ percentile by an amount that allows them to have a low level functioning in primary school. And instead of having behaviour regulation issues that keep them out of primary school, allows them to engage extraordinary stuff. Um, and so we're rolling that out around the country. It's also, I said, about the nutrition intervention. Unfortunately, the fastest growing prison population in Australia at the moment is young Indigenous women. And we've got this invisibility of average on Trust Strait Islander men in anything other than deficit language discourse in um, policy interventions and in science. So the other thing that's catalyzing my thinking around this was around um, Tony Abbott in 2014 put in place truant school officers as a way of getting kids into school, so punish children into school. That'll get them really excited about getting there. And um, what we ended up doing in one year, I remember one year we had all the kids turn up to school and there weren't enough desks and stuff um, for them to be able to sit at. And, uh, and I said, we're going to do this work up in what area? And everyone said, I oh, haven't what area been done to death. I said, absolutely. Do you remember the time when we tried to get all the primary schools in school, uh, kids to school, and there weren't enough desks? Everyone laughed. They said, well, guess how old those kids are now? And they went, yeah, adolescents. So how many children are there in what area? I think there's like 2,500 children in what area, a population of 3,000, and the numbers are growing. It's not a Catholic mission. You can just tell sometimes. And the other one is around changing the agenda from school preparation to one that addresses developmental vulnerabilities at the time when we're able to have the good impact so that we're actually getting kids to school and able to participate. Finally, the um, Children's Commissioner here in Victoria talked about the fact that we've got this large number of children in care. We've done the um, audits of the thousand children who are currently in out-of-home care and we found that over 90% of families um, have been... Um, have, have neglected their children, and a range of different things make up for that. But predominantly, it's around parental um, experiences of good um, parental. Ex what am I trying to say? They just don't have access to education about what it means to be a parent because their parents were parented, and a whole range of these children now, their parents themselves were removed as children. And so you just see these intergenerational impacts of child removal. And then finally was this British um, Medical Journal article which talks about the need for um, an approach which um, focuses on adolescence, is nested and draws different sectors together. So Michael Marmot talked about the need to um, address a whole of life process starting with women of childbearing age, that this would have a really marked impact on how we actually improve equity outcomes. And because of who we are, we've changed it up a little bit in that the position of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia isn't only our job to make it so. We're less than a million people by population in the context of 24 million people. Over half of our adolescents are under the age of 15. Over half of our population is under that age, actually. And what we need to do is take a collectivist approach to be able to do that. Through four symposium, what we've been able to do is design then an Indigenous perspective of the first thousand days, which starts from the birth of the grandparents, through to the birth of parents, and through to the birth of children now. 
And this intergenerational approach is critically important, particularly in how we're thinking about doing the epigenetics work in the longitudinal study, but also just understanding the powerful impact that um, grandparents and parents have on the growing of children. Like I said, we had four symposia and we had um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from all over the country with gerontologists, policy makers. We brought together um, researchers, community people, and scientists across each of these different um, um, symposia. And we've had one recently with health economists, and we've really started to build on what the program work looks like. There's a few more people there from um, drug and alcohol work to early learning centres to family based um, strategists, um, gerontologists, and the goal that's come out of that work is to provide a coordinated comprehensive intervention to address the needs of children from conception to age two, thereby laying the, world, the foundations to health and wellbeing into the future. There's a really critical core. Um, important piece of work there to do as well about the preconception work. So what is it that makes a decision, what empowers a person to make a decision to become an effective parent before you become a parent? That's the only time to have these kind of conversations. So we are taking a really novel approach to early life approaches and we're twisting a whole lot of people's minds about this. Particularly, I love scientists, I just love them dearly because they say, how are we going to do a preconception um, longitudinal study. I don't know. How are we going to do it? Huh? How are we going to make that happen? People go to work. Can't we do it from birth? No, no, we can't. We're going to do it from pre-birth. But how do we know when people are going to become pregnant? I don't know. Work it out. Come back and tell me. It's very exciting. Go, team, go. <laughs> so there is a room in Walter Elizabeth Hall uh, where they're just going to town trying to work this out. It's fantastic. I feel like Henry Ford when they came to and said, it can't be possible. We can't make a six-cylinder or an eight-cylinder engine. Yes, it is. Go back and do it. <laughs> so these are the ten program areas that we're going to be working on across different regions. And this is really critical because we believe that these are the ten really strong foundations for building strong <coughs> families that are going to help support people through that first thousand days of life. And the reason why we're doing this, it's um, a combination of cultural authority and morality and reinvesting in that, because quite frankly what happens in some of our communities at the moment is depraved. It's just depraved. There is no need for it. There is no excuse for it. And it's an indictment upon all of us to really make an investment in cultural authority and morality. We're also going to develop a workforce. So instead of vulnerable people having to interface with about seven or eight different professional groups during that period of time, it'd be great to have one workforce that actually help broker and arrange all those different services brought to them in their households. Preconception programs and family led decision making is all critical. We are targeting adolescents, men and women of reproductive age, neonates and infants and children, and there are multi-agency strategies. We're starting from the household and building our way out, which is very exciting. And we've got a whole range of regional sites on board already. So we've got Warrington Peninsula, Western Melbourne, Northern Melbourne, the ACT and Shepparton at this point. So it's predominantly focused around Victoria although Queensland have invited us up and so they're going to start becoming regional advocates for this sort of work and the Alliance site will be where we actually do the longitudinal study from. And so in terms of some of the questions that we're thinking through at the moment is what measures can be developed across three generations and why? And one of the immediate long-term benefits of this, if I'm going out and talking to people about having to give urine and um, faeces samples from three generations, and I've got to have a really good narrative as to why that's important. <laughs> Pee and this and who and that. I mean, I could, it, it, don't, don't cross-infect their samples if you can in any way do that. And so in terms of some of those sorts of things, um, it's going to be really extraordinary because we've got the only um, Indigenous-led genomics centre anywhere in Australia, and so we're future-proofing this by having a whole lot of biological samples. We're doing work across preconception, conception, pregnancy, birth, movement at two and six years. I'm just really interested in what happens during a family from the period of time from conception through to a child getting to primary school, and what kinds of things can we do to um, nurture families through some really difficult and stressful times. And what we're doing at the moment is working with the Victorian Aboriginal Housing Cooperative, 
we're training um, public house um, tenants to become peer researchers. And this is the preconception baseline survey work. So we're taking them down to Walter or Aldersmith Hall to go and see what it means to work in a laboratory. We're um, training them and they've actually got employment out of it. And what we're doing now is um, really building this multi-generational, predominantly urban living longitudinal study hasn't been done anywhere else before. And what we've got now is um, a range of different organisations who are all part of the first, family, first thousand days family now, including um, Monash Latrobe, um, Murdoch Children's Research Institute, um, Melbourne Hospital, as well as uh, We Home University of Melbourne. And these are the sorts of things that we really want to be able to have an impact on. Um, understanding what happens in households, understanding how services engage with um, families and in particular at that household level, and then what happens across families over time. So they're the kinds of pieces of work that we're pulling together right now. In terms of what it is that we all do, I think it's been fairly well recognised now by the Children's um, Rights Commissioner about the importance of the First Thousand Days program and its impact particularly on child protection, keeping kids at home in families rather than in, um, in out-of-home care arrangements. That's, first, that's our first goal, really. And in order to do that, what we'll do is be the partner. We'll convene a whole range of different people and organisations to come together. We'll facilitate the knowledge exchange to evaluation and we'll really help develop up the workforce so these are the sorts of things that we're really interested in being able to do. The other thing is about where to from here. At the moment, um, we're about 702 days into this piece of work. Still haven't um, been funded to do it, but I'm going boldly where no person's gone before. <laughs> well, actually, lots of people have probably gone there. We've just gone and said, you know what, I'm just going to make this happen because my heart is open, my mind is open. We're having these extraordinary human-to-human contexts in context that we're context that we um, we're working through and people get inspired by it um, because what it started off was a way of addressing and identifying um, developmental vulnerabilities and now what it's turned into is how can we use this period of time in a person's life to mobilize a change in the systems that we're part of in the programs that we're doing in the workforces that we're engaging with in the experiences of child protection and vulnerability and how can we really use this period of time to um, help everyone achieve and be the very best that they can be. And what we're doing now is really um, extraordinary again in that most of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's connectedness happens with New Zealand populations and over in the Americas populations. We've started to connect with the Sami people in Pal and Norway. So we've had a delegation from the Sami Parliament come to Australia and um, meet up with us about the first thousand days. We've got work happening in our own communities and then also in Indonesia. The reason why that's important is that Sami people have got political representation, but statistically they are invisible. We've got statistical recognition, but very little political um, representation, although that's changed with the last parliament, I must say. Um, and in terms of the Indonesian populations, we're working with the Australian Indonesian Council and their tribal people's diversity is as represented as the 300 nations of people here in Australian context. And so that way of having diversity of lived experience, I think, will be something that we'll really be able to share. In terms of the, uh, where we're at, um, we're only interested in radical transformation. That's the only thing I'm going to put my life to now. I can't do incremental change anymore. In the 722 days since I had my aha moment, I thought, wow, wouldn't this be a brilliant thing to pull off? Let's see if I can make this happen in a university context, because I've done it in lots of other contexts. I've actually missed out on capturing about 10,000 kids who have been born across Australia and being born into vulnerable circumstances that could have been changed as a result of having this kind of intervention happen. And in terms of why it is that this is important, is that this is a copy of the report um, that went through to Parliament and was a presentation on the Close the Gap process. But if you have a look, a young um, Aboriginal woman who's an epidemiologist herself is pregnant. She's just had a lovely little baby now, but she came and drew two lines on this graph for me. 
And the downward trend all happened under the auspice of a discourse which was framing up self-determination in Australia. So we had the National Aboriginal Health Strategy, we had public certainty amongst our community controlled health organisations, the deaths in custody report, we had land rights activism, bilingual schools, all of those things that actually meant that we had a solid sense of ourselves. We had 2000, we had Reconciliation Australia release their report, people walking across bridges together, people crying in the streets with big sorry signs written in the sky. <coughs> and then after an act of parliament, 2005 acts, it was abolished and um, practical reconciliation came in. In 2007, we had the Melbourne Territory intervention and you can start to see things starting to plateau at around about that time. And then from there, it's just been downward. We've had um, changes in procurement laws, which mean now that non-government organisations can also competitively tender for running Aboriginal programs. We had the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples. I helped set that up, um, and that's now being defunded. We had reconciliation action plans. We've got the opportunity to have um, constitutional reform, all of which I need to convince um, the voting public in Australia that that's going to happen and that's been a very odd conversation to be part of because I still don't know what the Vietnamese community in Cabramatta actually think about Indigenous peoples having um, been recognised in the constitution. I don't know. Um, and we've got more children in care, less employment in the Australian public service than ever before and we've had the rise of racism. I think the whole experience of Adam Goods in recent times has been really demonstrative of the kind of um, experiences of discrimination. And then recently we had the Black Lives Matter um, campaign and protest in the streets here again, and we had the forced closures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities where we closed down central um, Melbourne. And, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, when people come together as a collective it's never in a peaceful, or it's never described internationally as a peaceful way, so we're a group of angry blacks who are making the difference there. I just want to be able to quickly show you this film. It's only two and a half minutes, but I actually think, again, this is a real powerful way of being able to describe this beautiful way that we might be able to connect the first thousand days with the last thousand days. And I'm really hoping that these sorts of initiatives can start to um, gain more credence in an Australian context. Is there a book you'd like to look at with John? Here's Horton Hatch. Here's a who. Here's a walrus one. Here, honey. What's your name? Max. Huh? Max. 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 Oh, Matt. Max. Max. Matt. Max. Oh, Max. No, Max. Max. Bye bye. Don't you think they grow up pretty fast for being two? What do you think is going to happen to you guys? Do you think you're going to stay three and four and five forever? Never yeah. ever? You have to be a grown up sometime. No. No? I don't know if I can do it. I can't even do it. <laughs> Keep working on it. Can I sing? Ave Maria. You know how you, if you love somebody and they give you something, you know how hard it hits you on your heart. These <laughs> hard ones running out of my eyes.
the kids and I are here and we invited you to come mm -hmm. and celebrate happiness with us. There is only one time to be happy and that time is now. These guys have, what, about 50, 60, 70, 80 more years of collecting happy. Yes. <laughs> you guys have about 80 years or more to look forward to get more happy things. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> still a step on our foot. <laughs> parents who live in aged care homes at the moment, or grandparents, or how often you get a chance to go and visit them. And I don't know how many of you are thinking about where you might live the last thousand days of your life, and what that's going to look like. And I just thought that that was a really beautiful way of closing the circle on this first thousand days and the last thousand days and what that could look like as a lived experience together. And certainly um, for our communities and for any person, when you're old and lonely, um, what you want to do more than anything in the world is be where life is. And so having the opportunity to have that in your space and around you at that time is, I think, something really worthy of thinking through during this process. It also then speaks to our great work and our way into the future. And I really do wish all of you very, very well on this journey. Great works are performed not by strength but by perseverance. And in terms of that, that's the last comment that I'll have for today. I just want to say thank you very much. And yes, that is me. And yes, I was a young teenage mum and I was living in a caravan park and if anyone would have told me that 27 years later on, my son would be in the Air Force, my daughter would have finished a university degree and um, be working at University of Melbourne and saving the environment while the other one's shooting it up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would have laughed a ridiculous amount, but you know, that's, that's what it means. That just there are so many wonderful opportunities there for each and every one of us, no matter what our circumstance. Just please at the risk of sounding like a booper ad, just go out and be the very, very best version of yourselves that you can possibly be, because all of us in the world need you to do that. Thank you.